Daron is, in addition to NBR and MIT, he is a CIFAR fellow, uh, one of our conference sponsors. Daron, go ahead. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. It's a great conference. And uh, sorry, I was teaching yesterday, so I couldn't be here. So uh, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about automation, new tasks, the implications of task content of technology for labor demand. It's joined with uh, the better half of this relationship, Pascual Restrepo, who's sitting there. And uh, let me just jump, jump right into it. You know, if you look at the data, labor demand has been extremely anemic over the last uh, 40 years or so. 30, 35 uh, years, I'll show you, it actually starts around 40 years. So here is an inclusive measure of labor demand, which is the wage bill per population. This is both employment and what goes to wages, so essentially what firms are paying for labor. And if you look at this over the uh, 40 years before 1987, you know, it has some ups and downs, but it's growing fairly steadily. If you look at it since 1987, it has a very weak growth until about the end of the 1990s, and then it's pretty much flat. So this is a remarkable pattern, and it's still poorly understood. We have a lot of work on you know, what's going on to employment, and some of them emphasize labor supply factors. You know, they might be playing a role, but only indirectly, because this is showing there's something quite remarkable going to lay on with labor demand. So a natural question that many in this room have asked is whether this is related to new technologies and automation and so on and so forth. We're actually going to say, in some sense, yes, it's going to be all about what we're going to define as the task content of production. In some sense, there is still a raging debate and not a complete agreement about what automation and new technologies do. And some people blame it for everything. Some people think that automation is just another type of technology. It's not going to be any different this time. As productivity picks up, uh, employment and wages are going to pick up also. Or perhaps it's going to be even better. So our answer is that one has to distinguish between different types of technologies and what they do. Automation technologies, because they change the task content of trade adversely for labor, they actually reduce labor demand in, in a well-defined uh, way, or at least reduce labor demand relative to productivity, while other technologies might be counterbalancing that. So in particular, we're going to be pointing out to the creation of new tasks as a type of technology that counterbalances automation by improving the, change, uh, improving the task content of production. And both of these technologies are very different from what most labor economists and macroeconomists work with factor augmenting technologies. And a subtext of this talk and a lot of the research that Pasquale and I have been doing is to say, actually, it's time to sort of abandon the singular focus on factor augmenting technologies. Not only are they not descriptively good, but they're actually not helping us explain the world. All right, so what I'm going to do is first I'm going to explain what we mean by the task content of frame, uh, the, the task framework using a single sector, so the simplest setting. If I don't trip on this and kill myself first, uh, we'll go over a multi sector uh, version of it, which will be a vehicle for us to look at the data. So, looking at the data through the lenses of that model. And using a variety of different data sources, we're then going to be able to decompose labor demand changes, essentially for the last uh, 70 years, but also going uh, before that a little bit to the time of mechanization of agriculture, and try to make the case that actually the data speaks very much uh, to the importance of the changes in the task content of production. OK, so why is it important to think in terms of task content of uh, production? Well, if you look at the, the, the history, it's full of examples of automation, starting from the British Industrial Revolution to mechanization of agriculture, more recently to industrial automation. And of course, uh, you can think of these in whatever way you want, but the typical way that people have sort of used this, for example, factor augmenting technologies, some technologies that make labor more productive, some technologies that make capital more productive. It's just descriptively, it's very difficult to map these things into them. But more importantly, they really are not helping us understand how 
different tasks, different parts of the production process are getting reallocated to different factors. And what I'm going to show you, in fact, is that the comparative statics of technology are completely different between factor augmenting technologies and the task model. So in particular, this strong emphasis that I'm putting on some technologies reduce labor demand while others increase, that's pretty nigh impossible in the factor augmenting framework. So what we're going to do now is present such a framework building on Zera, my work with David, and my previous work with Pasquale. It's very simple. It's one sector. But within that one sector, you need to perform a number of tasks in order to uh, complete production. So if you're going to do textiles, you know, you need to do spinning, weaving, drawing, carding, coloring, marketing, etc., etc. Those tasks are these YZs. They are combined in a CES fashion that doesn't really matter so much. And then there's a range of one of tasks that goes from N minus 1 to N. Each task can be produced by capital or labor. So LZ is labor allocated to task Z. It's multiplied by a gamma L function, which is essentially its productivity in that task, and it's multiplied by AL, which is a factor augmenting technology. So we're not ruling out factor augmenting technologies, but, but we'll see that's not where the action is. But also, most importantly, some tasks are automated and can be produced by either capital or labor. So capital has the exact same structure. And within a task that's been automated, Capital and labor don't have the same productivity, so these gamma z's are here, for example, but they are perfect substitutes. So that's what replacement means. Once you have automated a task, you can either use capital or labor. If you want to use capital, you can do so. But some tasks are not automated, and those have to be produced by capital. So therefore, the two key things for us are an index of what has been automated, i, Auto by automation, we mean an increase in I here, expanding the tasks that can be produced by capital, allowing capital to replace labor in tasks that it was previously performing. And by new tasks, we mean expansion of the set of tasks. And then we're sort of assuming that this gamma L, gamma K are such that labor has a comparative advantage in new tasks. So the key thing is that by new tasks, we're you know, there might be, of course, there are new tasks that are just uh, performed by capital. But for us, new tasks are those in which labor has a comparative advantage. Okay? So now, the reason why this framework is sort of tractable is because you can solve out everything, and you can write a uh, production function for this sector, which takes this form. So this looks like a CES production function. And cap uh, factor augmenting technologies have exactly the same effects that you would be used to in your st standard CES, but the share parameters of the CES, the alpha 1 minus alpha that sometimes you omit when you write CES quickly, well, those now become endogenous, and they depend not just on comparative advantage but and the elasticity of substitution, but they depend on this N and I, automation and new tasks. Labor share, which will play an important role in this industry, will be given by this expression. Now, it depends on wage and uh, factor augmenting technologies in the usual manner, but those are second order for a reason that we're going to see. Because these don't affect the allocation of tasks to factors. If you make capital more productive, you expand the tasks that capital produces, but you don't take away tasks from labor. On the other hand, this gamma here, this is all about which tasks go to capital, which tasks go to labor. So this is what we're going to call task content of trade. In the special case where these gammas are constant or sigma is equal to 0, this would be simply n minus i. So n new tasks expand the number of tasks going to labor. i contracts the number of tasks going to labor. Now with that in mind, you can ask what's the effect of different types of technologies on labor demand? Well, again, but for labor demand, we're going to use wage bill. That's a very simple decomposition. This log change in labor demand when I change automation, the I, is equal to a productivity effect. How much do I increase that producti the productivity in that industry? And a displacement effect. The displacement effect is always negative because I'm taking away tasks. The productivity effect is always positive. Which one wins out? You cannot know. It will depend on the specific features of the technology. In particular, it will depend how productive automation technologies is at the margin relative to labor. 
The worst would be what we call so-so technologies. They displace labor, but they're not so much more productive than labor that they create a big productivity effect. And I'm emphasizing this because this will be an important part of interpreting the data. Another comment, if the displacement effect wasn't here, labor share would be constant because this is, these are log derivatives. So it would be that when I increases, labor demand wage bill increase exactly as much as productivity. But since the displacement effect is negative, automation always reduces the labor share. So that's a very important thing because when you're used to factor augmenting technologies, you'll think, oh, it will depend on elasticity of substitution. No, it doesn't. And in fact, the elasticity of substitution really is not the right concept for thinking about whether technology reduces or increases the labor share. Okay, what about new tasks? They work in the opposite manner. They create a positive effect, but they also call what we call a reinstatement effect. They reinstate labor into new tasks, so they have a double whammy for labor. They expand the labor share, again, because now this is positive, and they will clearly increase labor demand because there are two effects going in the right direction. If you look at factor augmenting technologies, they have a productivity effect. There is a substitution effect, but it's completely regulated by sigma and tends to be small for realistic values of the elasticity of substitution. That's why factor augmenting technologies, they would have a very hard time explaining the data, and I'll show you that in a second. Okay, so now go, let's go to a multi-product, uh, sorry, multi-sector world. Now what you can do is this is an exact decomposition of how labor demand in the aggregate economy changes. Now this is actually quite neat because there, this is fairly model independent. The only thing we are assuming is that firms are along the labor demand curves plus the sort of the structure that I've imposed, but it's more flexible than other things. So there's one effect, which is the productivity effect. The second is this composition effect. Psi i is the value added share of sector i. So when output gets reallocated from manufacturing to services, how does that affect labor demand? Well, again, this measure of labor demand was the wage bill. It affects it as a function of how the labor share of the different sectors are different. If the labor share of the different sectors are pretty close, this composition effect is going to be very small. Now, this composition effect is important because if you look at the literature, a lot of the emphasis is on the composition effect. But we'll be able to measure that directly from the data. Then there is this change in task content where the little ai is the labor share of the industry. So this is this proportional change in that. There is substitution across tasks. Wages are potentially different across industries. Capital, perhaps inclusive of profits, is different across industries. Labor types might be different. So that's all captured here. That's regulated by this 1 minus sigma, and then this. So now the thing is that this, if we had all the data we wanted, we could directly apply this decomposition. This we can measure, this we can measure, this we can measure without any assumptions from the data from, you know, we're going to use industry level data at different levels of disaggregation. This we can measure because we have these, these. We don't have sigma, but we can do it for different values of the sigma. It turns out not to matter. This we cannot measure because it has the factor augmenting technologies in it. But as I said, factor augmenting technologies don't matter so much. So you can choose whatever you want. I'll start with a baseline of choosing uh, choosing AL over AK growing at 1.5 a year, but we'll show you it doesn't really matter, or I won't show you today, but it doesn't really matter. So then if you, if you do all of that, then you get the task content of that industry, and then aggregating up from the industry of the economy as a residual. So here is the equation. The task content in industry I at time t is the change in the log labor share of that industry minus these terms here where we observe this, we observe this, we assume some value sigma here. So I will uh, <coughs> start with a value of 0 0.8, which is the estimate at the industry level that's best uh, documented, and then make these assumptions. And then the change in task content of the economy is just summed across uh, all these industries using their labor, uh, labor allocation. All right, so here is the data. So we're going to use data for, uh, for two sub-periods because there is a change in industry codes, et cetera, but you, know, you, could, you could link them together. But actually, the two sub-periods are behaving differently, so it's actually a good way of uh, presenting it also. We're going to be using data for 60, 61 industries. Uh, we do exactly everything with more detailed industries for about uh, uh, using 300 rather than just about 40 manufacturing industries. But the patterns are here. This is what's going on with the labor share of different 
roughly one-digit industries. We know the labor share is falling, and other pap papers have pointed this out too, but it's mostly coming from manufacturing. Construction, transportation, services, agriculture, they have very stable labor shares. Mining has a declining labor share, but mining is small, as you can see that from here. Manufacturing is both contracting and has a declining labor share. And here is the decomposition when we apply it to the data between 1987 and 2017. This is the period of anemic growth. Now, in this figure, you cannot see it, but go back because I'm not comparing it. But this is fairly slow growth. If you compare it to the first figure that I showed you, the comparison of 87 to about 2000 is slower, quite a bit slower than what went on before 1987. But during that anemic growth, you have labor demand, the observed wage bill, follow the productivity effect. Let's look at the other things. Composition effect is completely small. The price substitution effect, the fact that wages and inter, uh, uh, rental payments across industries are changing, those are completely small. But after about 2000, there is a decoupling of productivity growth and observed wage bill. Productivity still increases a little bit more slowly, but observed wage bill is essentially constant in this period. And that decoupling is completely due to the change in the task content. So the change in the task content is already somewhat negative. This is the net change in task content, but it becomes much more negative. Where is that coming from? It's coming a lot from manufacturing. So here is the same decomposition just for the manufacturing industries. And you see why labor demand is so weak. Actually, observed wage bill is declining sharply in manufacturing, especially after 2000. The productivity effect is very weak, and there is a huge change in task content. How do we make sense of that change in task content? Well, one way of doing that is actually decompose it further into displacement and reinstatement effects. So under the assumption that there is no technological regress, and that a given industry at the same time is not doing both uh, nuke tasks and automation, so that's a, not a completely natural assumption, but it's not crazy either, we can sort of decompose it into displacement and reinstatement effects. These are lower bounds because if there is continuous re uh, automation and new task creation at the industry level at short frequencies, then our estimates would be an understatement of these. So if you do that, you see that at any point in time, there is both this reinstatement effect, new tasks, or things that increase the uh, task content in favor of labor and those that reduce it. But the displacement effect is larger. This goes from 0 to about 10. This goes from 0 to uh, about 17. But if you look at within manufacturing, it's much more unbalanced. And that's what's leading to this change in task content. A huge decline due to displacement and, and this reinstatement. Now, of course, at this point, you might say, well, you know, but this is all residual. Perhaps it means something else. And it might. You know, uh, many of the elements that we are measuring in the data are actually, uh, you know, the composition effect is fairly, fairly solid, but perhaps we are really wrong on the uh, factor augmenting technologies, et cetera. Well, actually, here is if you wanted to explain the data without any change in task content, so you fed whatever you need for AL and AK, but no technological regress. This is what you would need. So this is the actual observed TFP. You would need to have about three times, two and a half times of that just coming from capital augmenting technological changes. And you would need to have about 10 times of that coming from labor augmenting technologies. It's just impossible to explain the data with factor augmenting technologies. But still, we have a residual. But does that residual make sense? So here is one way of doing that is we can look at whether our measure of <coughs> uh, re, uh, automation and replacement correlates with measures of automation and, uh, sorry, automation and uh, new tasks correlate with actual measures of automation and new tasks. And so that's what we do. Of course, I don't have time to go through it. But here are the measures of automation. This is a penetration of robots that Pasquale and I used before. These are replaceable occupations from Greats and Michaels' work. These are 
detailed SMT technologies, advanced automation technologies, and they're all negatively correlated with the change in task content at the industry level, as you would expect if we are really capturing automation. And we do the same thing for new tasks using new job titles and the changing uh, um, uh, occupational structure, some indices that we've created ourselves. And again, you expect to see a positive relationship here because these are new tasks and you do see exactly that. What I want to end with is, well, let's now contrast this to 1947 to 1987. Well, one thing is labor shares are now much more stable. And as a result of that, <clears throat> here is the pattern, much faster growth of observed wage bill, but it tracks productivity effect. The gap between these two things is very small. You have a negative composition, a negative task content change, but it's small. The composition effect and the price substitution effects continue to be small. So if you do this for manufacturing, you see that things start going wrong for manufacturing around 1970s. But, but for the whole economy, you don't see the effect of it much until the 30-year period that I focused on. And why is that? Well, because now the displacement effect is there, but it's being balanced. It's being counterbalanced by the reinstatement effect. So therefore, the crucial thing is, A, we really need to think about these changes in task content to understand the data. And when you do that, you see really both the effects of automation, which is, takes the form of this displacement effect, and you also see the counterbalancing forces that really scream to be there, and everything for the aggregate labor demand, of course, their subgroup analysis is interesting, but for aggregate labor demand, seem to be about the balance of that, whether displacement is running ahead or not. But that then brings us to a conclusion, which is my concluding conclusion. You know, if you want to make sense of this, you know, the change in task content is changing adversely against labor, but we're not getting productivity. This very much smells of so-so technologies. Now, there are many people here are great experts in technologies. Many people are hugely excited about new technologies. But if you look at the data, they're just not delivering. Now, they may be because they're not good. They may be because we're not using them right. They may be because we are overdoing the, the, uh, the, uh, the displacement and not doing other things we should be doing. But they're not delivering. And the, the, change in the task content and the productivity effect going both against labor is the main reason why labor demand is so bad. So in conclusion, I think the most important thing I want you to take away, but of course debate, is this new framework, which is this changes in task content, displacement, and reinstatement effect. But I also tried to make the case that not only is that conceptually relevant, useful, but it also helps us understand the data better. And I look forward to hearing from Melissa. OK, great. Thanks. So it's a privilege to be here. Thanks for the opportunity to discuss this paper by Daron and Pasquale. Um, I'm just going to start by trying to situate the paper in, in sort of the public rhetoric around what we're talking about. And clearly, these are notions that this room is well familiar with. But I want to bring us back to these sort of vague notions and claims, because this is really the jumping off point for the paper and what the paper makes precise and rigorous in a really useful way that can move the, both the academic literature and the public discourse forward. So I'm, I'm just going to put my spin on the way I usually hear these things talked about. We have the fully pessimistic view that even though people in this room don't seem to espouse it, you really hear a lot of this in public uh, policy conversations. There's definitely a powerful narrative out there that the robots are coming for all the jobs. So we'll, we'll term that the fully pessimistic view. And countering that is the view I think that some people in this room are more likely to espouse, which is the fully optimistic view, saying that you know technology is going to boost productivity and new jobs will be, will be created. We just haven't imagined them yet. And a variant of that that I hear from a lot of labor economists in their retort to the folks who are worried about the robots taking our jobs is, We've seen this movie before. We had the agricultural revolution. People moved into manufacturing. Everyone always thinks this time is different, and it never is. And so then the burden of proof is sort of on the pessimists to say, why might this time be different? There's a tempered optimism, which is, Technology will raise productivity, but we'll acknowledge that maybe that's just for some set of people, and there are people who are going to be left behind, at least in the transition, but that's not a productivity or an automation problem. That's a distribution problem. 
So almost by way of confessional to this AI group, I will admit to having what I might call myself as like a tempered worry. So like maybe that's true and I could see in the long run how it might all work out, but distribution problems are actually real. And I've said this before, but I, you know, my, in my mind, the idea that there's going to be some very productive class that makes a lot of money and is very productive, and then we have another class that we just sort of redistribute money to, that's a pretty dystopian view of society. Society. So I actually think the distribution problems are real. But also, it might take a really long time for the new jobs to be created, and they might not pay very well, and they might require a set of skills that a large part of the population just isn't up to. Um, so what's nice about this paper is that it actually gives us a framework and a language to be specific when we talk about these vague notions and have these kind of debates. OK, so let me, let me just uh, put this in sort of the context of two things that we worry about, just so we're all on the same page. Uh, there really have been sizable declines in the employment to population ratio in the U.S. over the past 20 years. And in particular, the worry comes from the fact that these declines have been largest among young and prime age workers. In fact, older workers are the only ones we see in the U.S. whose labor force, has incre labor force participation rates or employment rates have increased. And so this is where the worry comes from. And going back to, okay, um, you know, going back to like the recession, we all know that there's been a steady recovery, so jobs are coming back. But folks without college degrees have still not returned to their pre-recession levels of employment. So this is a real challenge, and I do think the worries about declining employment, um, you know, have have merit. Let's talk about. Technology. Okay, so you know, let's bring it back to supply and demand. I know we saw this yesterday, but in my mind, like we could never have enough of the basic supply and demand to to focus our thinking. You, you know, most people who think about trying to explain the declines for employment worry wonder well, how much of this is a shift down in the demand curve versus a shift back in the supply curve. And what Darone and Pasquale have focused on is helping us understand the role of robots and technology in thinking about these downward shifts in the demand curve. Okay? There's also reasons why we might think supply has shifted backward. And then outside of this sort of textbook model, we have institutional factors and labor market frictions, increased reductions in geographic geographic mobility, um, increased occupational licensing, all these other things that are outside the framework, but people pause explanations. The other thing we know, I don't know if I can figure out how to go backwards, okay, is that as Jerome pointed out, compensation has really stagnated. And I think it's fair to say that the conventional wisdom as to why compensation has stagnated is attributable to two reasons, both the slowdown in productivity growth and also the fall in the labor share. And this is the jumping off point for this paper trying to explain this, um, this feature. So what this paper does in a really nice accessible way is give a framework and a language that once you read the paper, at least in my view, it was sort of surprising me to, to think that we didn't already have this, and I mean that in a very complimentary way. We sort of need this language and this precision to have the debates that people have been having both within the literature and in the public discourse, and until this paper, we didn't have it. So in that sense, I think it is um, you know, a really important, powerful paper that sort of sets the, sets the framework for the debate going forward. It, it sort of makes this... I think ex post obvious distinction, but incredibly powerful and important, there's, there's a distinction to be made between factor enhancing technology and automation technology. And it shows very clearly in this framework that automation may or may not lead to, we may not, may or may not see declining labor share and labor demand um, as automation raises. So they fit this to historical data, which I won't spend much time on because Jerome did that quite nicely. All right, so I'm going to take the, all of the math. I wasn't sure how technical Jerome's presentation was going to be and just put it in language. These, I think, are the real key takeaway points. Um, what you need to know about this paper, they assigned the different elements of what technology does to different uh, effects for labor demand, um, demand for labor and labor share. There's the productivity effect, which all technology has, that makes 
uh, the demand for labor go up. There are the quality substitution effects. This can go up or, or up or down. This is what has traditionally been modeled in these uh, papers. And this is about factor enhancing technology. And then the innovation of this paper is to give us two more types of effects, which are the displacement effects that comes from the automation technology. And this is all about the I. How many tasks are in this set I that can be done by capital? And as we have innovations in automation, I increases at the, uh, you know, the, the labor suffers as a result. And then there's this offsetting effect called the reinstatement effect, where there's a new task, where there's a new, new sets of tasks N. So the race here is all between I and N in figuring out how labor is going to fare. So here's my really highly technical theoretical suggestion for the authors, which is I sort of wanted these technologies to have a label in the sense that, you know, we go very clearly from the factor, uh, factor enhancing technologies and automation technologies to these terms. And the paper is a bit agnostic as to where this reinstatement effect is going to come from. Um, should we expect more or less to happen when the innovations take the form of factor enhancement versus automation? Does this rely on the entrepreneurial class or managerial uh, innovation? It wasn't clear to me where this is coming from, um, but it just states it as, as an effect that needs to be considered. And so the insights from the framework is it's all going to be about this I for N, as I, as I mentioned. The insights come very clearly from the single sector framework, and then the authors extend it usefully to a multi-sector framework. OK, they take it to the data. I won't run through this. Jerome already did. One thing I want to point out is this paper does not try to model everything. So the, you know, the wage bills assume to reflect these elements of production. So in terms of what people debate in the public sphere about what's driving the decline in labor share, for example, one of the leading ideas is this reduction in, in unions or potentially an increase in monopsony power. Anything that's increased the wedge between the wages that labor received and their marginal product is sort of outside of the framework. And I think in terms of the decomposition, potentially some of that is picked up in what's labeled the changing task content. Okay, So you know, it's something that maybe can be in an enhanced version of the model. But just more to the point, the, the paper can't answer that question. OK, um, can I take one more minute? OK, thanks. So, the other thing the paper doesn't do is try to explain why and when certain types of technologies are developed, though the authors have other work that does that. And the paper doesn't try to predict which types of technologies are coming, and this framework isn't really set up for that. So we could still have plenty of room for optimism, pessimism, and everything in between. Um, and then as I mentioned, sort of related to the fact it doesn't try to model everything, is that it doesn't really help us answer the question of what's been driving the decline in employment. So I'll, I'll just indulge me for another 45 seconds. So this is something that I've been thinking a lot about over the past couple of years. And with a joint paper with my colleague, Catherine Abraham, we actually try to quantify what factors are responsible for the decline in the EPOP that we've seen in the US. And at the end of the day, we assign pretty significant, uh, significant effects two demand side factors in particular. And based on previous work by the authors, we give a sizable effect to the adoption of industrial robots. And so one thing that I've been left wondering from that literature is that when you read the empirical literature, and we've surveyed over 150 studies, it seems clear that previous types of technology, like computerization, shifted people into different occupations and had wage impacts, negative wage impacts for non-college educated people. But the adoption of robots actually induced people out of the workforce. And, and that difference has been striking to me, and I've sort of wondered why that is. Now, in the framework of this paper, the answer is, well, the reinstatement effect associated with robots was not as large, and so the displacement effect was larger. But I think that sort of begs the question as to, as to why and how much of that is about the skills people have, their ability to retrain, or the thickness of the labor market. Um, so the paper is super helpful and clarifies the discussion, but still leaves lots of open questions.